Welcome to VOM Module 4, Somatovisceral Disease and Myofascial Release Technique. The somatovisceral disease and myofascial release techniques that we will delineate in this module will basically be covered in this tape. This tape is designed for instructional uses only and is not designed to be a complete and total um, uh, record of how this technique is applied and used clinically. However, it gives us a good idea of how it is that we apply and is a reference tool for those of you who have forgotten how the technique might work and also exactly how it might in fact function. So, I'd have you sit back and uh, look at this tape and we'll see what it is that we can do to instruct you on the somatovisceral disease techniques and also the myofascial release techniques. We'll begin with somatovisceral disease and then we'll take up myofascial release technique as we get further along. Now, I should mention to you a couple things occurred. The cheesy music that you heard at the beginning of this uh, tape was because we had originally planned to have a section from um, uh, uh, Kenny G who lives down the lake from me here and uh, we like to put his music in, in this particular tapes. However, subsequent tapes, the people who produce my tapes have told me that for me to do that, I have to send Kenny G a tape. So I called him up and I actually talked to his business manager and his business manager told me that I have to send him at least $1,000 a second of the tape that I'm going to use as a copyright fee and also a, a, an administration fee of about $5,000, about $35,000 just to use about 30 seconds of his tape. And so we've decided to use um, some box music that comes from a little ocarina that's over here or a little music box. And so that's what that noise was all about. The nature of these tapes, as you can probably have imagined, is one of a more or less uh, do-it-yourself homemade type version. And the reason that is, is because of this. Module 1 tape, the Module 1 tape, which you saw, which was particularly homemade, thrown together version, we had to create in less than three days because we had to go to publish and we also had to have it duplicated within a week. And so that's the nature of that tape. However, for Module 2's tape, we decided that we'd get a little fancier, and we did. However, in completing Module 2 tape, we decided that we would have a professional do Module 3 tape. Now, if you've noticed, Module 3 tape is not done professionally because we found out for to do Module 3 tape in a professional fashion, the minimum was fifteen to $20,000, which would, of course, quadruple the cost of the tape and also double the cost of the modules. So we have chosen to keep this relatively homemade versions of this grassroots technology at this level at this point to try to make it more affordable. The nature of the information that we're going to provide for you is basic and whether we make it very fine-tuned and very uh, fancy or whether we give you the basic information will depend upon whether or not you give me a hundred dollars or or $500 for this specific tape. So I appreciate that, and I also appreciate your patience in me creating these uh, teaching tools. Nonetheless, there's something that we need to do and we like to do along with the, um, the actual uh, module itself, so you always have a reference on how to go ahead and apply the technology. So sit back and we'll go ahead and endeavor to show you the, basis, the basics of first somatovisceral disease technique. Now, Somatovisceral disease, or uh, somato to the visceral aspect of disease condition, is basically something that is held in place by a phenomenon of subluxation that occurs in a number of levels in the animal's body. Those levels aren't necessarily in the axial spine, however they can be periaxial or paraspinal. They can also be in the ganglion, actually, that's the pre- and paravertebral ganglion. They can exist, actually, at the wall of the organ, innervated, and also they can exist in the cranial area and in the sacral area. These areas actually exist here. We have the, the echelons of the paravertebral levels that come down here. Now the spinal cord in the center has, sends out uh, sympathetic uh, uh, first, uh, second, second degree neurons to the paras, uh, paraspinal ganglion or the paravertebral ganglion that comes down on either sides. It is thought a lot of times that this corresponds to the um, bladder meridian points. Um, I'm not an acupuncturist and um, these bladder meridian points of acupuncture may very well be what it is that we're contacting when we're coming down these areas. However, the paraspinal areas exist from T1 down to about T2 and also uh, they're just off the spine. They're different for each animal, however they're not a whole lot different. And then off the horse we're actually off about that far. So those are the paraspinal areas. So when we adjust a, a dog for a somatovisceral disease, or a cat or a horse, we're going to first go through a VOM pass, a classic VOM pass, and go through and classically adjust all the points. That will get the spinal considerations. 
Then we're going to go in and we're going to contact from T1 down to, T, to L2, T1 to L2. We're going to go down on either side of the paraspinal uh, area, and the paravertebral ganglion, and we're going to fire off those. Now what we're trying to do is we're trying to stop the irritation of the uh, sympathetic segments that are firing into uh, the visceral organs and actually decreasing their functionality, decreasing the functionality of the parasympathetic input. So as we go down here, what we're doing is we're trying to actually calm down the irritative um, uh, nature of the sympathetic neurons that are firing those particular glands and shutting them down for all intents and purposes. So what we're doing is we're going on either side. Now a lot of people would th think that we're contacting the zygopophyseal arch and we're very, very close to it in that regard. However, all we are now, instead of being on the dorsal spinous process, we're off to either side. And so we go down from T1 to L1. And in fact, we can actually go a little further down to L4 or L5 and getting those areas for the paraspinal ganglion. Okay, that's fine. Also called the paravertebral ganglion. Then, the other point that we're going to do in classic fashion is we're going to go into the head and do the areas of the... Um, the vagus nerve and also what we call the pituitary areas. And so that contact point is very similar to the VOM technology as we've used before, where we're going to go up and we're going to contact the areas around the head and the neck at the mastoid process and the styloid process. Keep in mind that in the small dog, the cat, and also in the horse, we cannot get our device head to that particular process to fracture it. Whereas that's a possibility in a human being, but it has never been a possibility in an animal because we just can't get the head of this device. Another reason that we don't ever want to take the tip off the device like this and use it in this fashion to try to get in there because we don't want to be able to put that much motion onto that particular prominence and, and possibly whack it off. I'm talking about the styloid process right here. Now, we're going to contact the, the uh, we're trying to stimulate the vagal centers that are actually being driven from this level. And so we're going to contact a number of points. First of all, we're going to do, in classic fashion, the wings of the atlas, as we've done before. And in small animals, that's, of course, going to be the situation. But what we're going to also do is we're going to come into this, uh, this animal on this regard, and we're going to contact the areas on the mastoid right up in here and the styloid here. Then we're also going to come up underneath and do what we call the pituitary motion. And what we'll do is we'll come in on the right side, uh, moving the the uh, trachea and esophagus to the left and fire it in that motion up in there. And so that will also hit, hit the pituitary. And what we're actu actually after is we're actually after putting a canoreceptor pulse into the brainstem area to free up the areas of the vagus that are being compromised or the areas that are transmitting information from the sympathetics all the way back down into the sympathetic ganglion that are on the paraspinal areas. And so there's a number of things that are occurring up here. So here again, we do the wings of the atlas, as we have before. And of course, we finish off in the dorsal spinous process here. And then we're also going to do the area on the lateral side on the skull, one side. Then we're going to go on the other side in this regard. And then we're also going to contact this dog on the occiput and fire it forward like this. Now, uh, in some cases, we will use a technique where we'll come underneath the animal with a specialized tool and we'll actually bring it up underneath in this regard like this where we have it right up onto that area like this. We'll show you this tool a little bit later on. This is the VetraStim device. Okay, so that basically handles that aspect of the parasympathetics in this area. We've done the sympathetics and now what we want to do is come back and finish off in the pelvis. In the pelvis we want to contact areas S1, I'm sorry, sacral S1, S2, and S3. For the equine, we want to contact area S1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And so the contact point is as simple as click, 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 click. Now, the reason in modules 1, 2, and 3 that we don't spend a lot of time advising you to contact and, and adjust the sacrum is just because of this. We don't know if we're adjusting a musculoskeletal problem or whether we're adjusting, in fact, a somatovisceral problem. The, the, the sacrum, essentially, if it's off, it's off because of a musculoskeletal problem. However, adjusting it will have a lot of positive benefits, which are somatovisceral in nature. And so that's why we um, leave that out of Module 1, 2, and 3, and now we're adding, adding it to Module 4. And so the adjustment here is click, click, click on the three different aspects or the three different prominences of the sacral vertebra. We'll also show you how we go about this in the horse.
to do is we're going to show a uh, somatovisceral approach to uh, reducing subluxation in this dog. This dog has no clinical problems as we see right now. It's had an exploratory surgery in the shoulder for OCD and that's been taken care of surgically. This dog is in fact um, uh, essentially normal. We're going to show you the points. First of all, the points that we're going to originally take care of when we uh, deal with the problem with uh, somatovisceral disease in the canine, there's six of actually different exelons that we're going to be dealing with. Six different echelons. The first echelon we always take care of with the veteran orthopedic manipulation technology and that's basically coming down the uh, dorsal spinous processes at the axial. That would be the axial echelon. The next echelon and the most important one in somatovisceral disease is in fact doing the paralumbar area and this is going to be the paralumbar uh, series of ganglion that goes down the side of the vertebral segments and these are in fact about this far away on this dog. This is the um, paraspinal processes, the um, paravertebral ganglion and essentially sympathetic to the intestinal organs. This in, in fact in, in increased amount of tonus for this particular area is what increases the tonus into the gland which decreases the parasympathetic tonus to the gland and shuts the gland down. So this is the major aspects down through here which we're trying to take care of. So this is the paraspinal echelon of somatovisceral disease and we're going to start at T2, T1 and T2 which is right here and we're going to go on either side. Click, 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 click all the way down the back of this dog. Click, click on either side. So. And so as we come down Willie, we're going to come down on either side, click, 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 click on each vertebra from T2, I'm sorry, from T1 down to L3. And so it looks like this. Now we were right in the center aspect when we made our original BOM passes, but now we're this far apart on this side. A lot of people think that these are the bladder meridians, the bladder acupuncture meridians. And whether they are or not is irrelevant. We're trying to uh, handle the paravertebral ganglion in this dog. Come here, Willie. Come here, sweetheart. And so we'll come down, click, click. It's okay, sweetheart. She's not feeling this. She's a little nervous. On either side of the back, all the way down, here, here here and here until we get to L3 which is at this point and that's essentially the end of the paravertebral ganglion. And then we're going to contact the third echelon of the VOM somatovisceral disease therapy is actually going after the sacral vertebral segment. She has sacral vertebral segments here, here and here and so we'll go at this point click, click and click at these particular points. Then we roll ourselves up to the anterior cervical area and we're going to contact, come here, come here Willie, come here Willie, we're going to contact in the in between the area just to the lateral part of her splenius muscle and right up in this area here we can put our hand right in there and there we're contacting the um, uh, vagosympathetic nerve trunk and we'll come right up the neck in this regard like this until we reach the lateral spinous process of the neck and once we're at the lateral spinous process of the wing of the atlas right here we can we've already contacted that in the VOM pass but now we're trying to get to this area which is the um, styloid process and the zy I'm sorry, the mastoid process. It's okay. It's okay, buddy. Pull your head up a little bit. This is the mastoid process. This is the styloid process. This is the wing of the atlas. Okay. Then the other point that we want to handle with her is we want to actually handle the pituitary point. Thanks. Thanks. Good. Mm -hmm. That's it. Good girl. Good girl. And as we pull her head up, we'll pull her uh, trachea and esophagus over to the side and put that right up against her skull and fire it right there. Notice it does not hurt. It would hurt you and me. We can do it on both sides. It hurts a little bit more on the right side, as you, on the left side, than it does on the right side. But it doesn't cause them pain. It would cause you and I pain. We're right up against the base of the neck. The other spot that we're going to contact would be the area just up here. Where the, where the cranial nerves come out of the skull. Sometimes hard to find in dogs that aren't quite as big as Wilhelmina. And that's the, the point right there. And so that takes care of that. The last point that we're going to contact in the, hull, in the skull would be up on top here where we actually have the occiput, the bone of the occiput, thought to be the knowledge lump in the canine, and we'll fire it down that direction. And so all these points are in fact contacted. Of this poor defenseless little kitty cat. Shaky is a little nervous about being adjusted for somatovisceral disease. Cats almost always assume the classic loaf of bread approach, and so they're going to lay there, usually like this. And we're going to go through 
from T1 down to T, uh, T1 down to L3 in this kitty cat and contact these positions in the cat too. Here is the central aspect, and we're going to go on either side. Click, 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 all the way down the back. I'm not actually pulsating because Shaky doesn't really have a problem. That's okay. And we're going to go down to the point about L3. It's only a stretch of, of tissue or potential spots from here to here. So we're going to go on either side, contacting the para, uh, paraspinal musculature and firing that. Notice that Shaky can lie over on her, his side because the spine out, out, out on this area. But Shaky, we don't want you to do that. We want you to lean into the camera, if you would, please. Shaky's a left-handed cat. Okay. And so... Here's the spot here, and here's the spot there. What you're going to do is you're going to follow down the dorsal spinous processes and be on either side of them like this. And then we're going to do the sacrum. The sacrum's um, done between the wings of the ilium and click, click, click down the sacrum three different positions. And then we'll come back up to the head. The head's hard to do in the cats because we can't hit all the points due to the fact that the kitty cat doesn't have a whole lot of spots between there. It's okay, crazy dog. And so what we'll do is we'll be up at this point and then we'll lift the leg in forward like this and get that area. In this cat, we can get to it pretty well. The occiput will come in underneath. Good kitty cat. We'll come in underneath the kitty cat like this. And this is not feeling good for the cat. It doesn't hurt the cat, but they're a little nervous. And you see that shakes the whole cat. And then on the other side, too, this is the pituitary point. I'm right up on the bone that's going to force itself into the pituitary. The left side is always the most difficult side to do. Because these kitty cats are somewhat more sensitive on the left side, due to the fact that the esophagus and the trachea have a tendency to move down that part of the body. Is that right? That's right. Okay, so again, what we'll do is we'll do all the area on the paraspinal tissues from T1 down to L3, the sacrum, come back up, and we'll do the area un around the neck, and we'll do the area uh, in the styloid and mastoid process, and then up underneath the neck for the pituitary and the back of the occiput. We essentially leave the vagosympathetic nerve trunk alone in the kitty cat outside of one or two pulses and they would look like this. Here is C, the wing of the atlas right here on this finger and so we would pulse the kitty cat right here. Extending the neck of the head forward and then allowing some, some tension on the vagosympathetic nerve trunk. This is, this is not anywhere on the lateral spinous processes of the vertebral segments which are right here. We're actually lower to that, yet we're above the trachea and the esophagus on the right and the left side. We have to keep in mind what it is that we're up to. Um, when we're going to do the horse, we're going to do the paraspinal areas, just like we did, in fact, in the dog. But we're going to come down the lateral aspects, and notice that they're some, somewhat much further along. Now, for this reason, we will very commonly use a device and go down either side. Click, click. The device is adequately set. Very commonly, you have not to use the equine adjusting tool, but just the regular adjusting tool. And start at T2 and go down on either side of the withers and either side down to about L1 to L3. Okay, and that can do the paraspinal ganglion or the paravertebral ganglion that we have in the horse. And that's the somatovisceral, that's the nidus of somatovisceral disease in the horse. That's the majority of the problem. However, we also want to contact the head and the neck. And we can also uh, uh, contact them up here. We again do the wings of the atlas in classic fashion. And then we also go on to the head. And we actually adjust the occiput just like we did before. Keeping in mind we can't really get to the, um, the styloid process on the equine and fracture it. So that's not a problem. Now, another thing that we will do in the equine is we will take the device. This is the equine. This is the vetrostim device. And we will set it at a point where it's going to fire one time like that, and we will place it in on that area and then fire it in that regard. We can load the device to where it fires one time and produces a pulse at that area. So we're, we can fine tune it with this device, but here again we can also use the basic tool to take care of this problem. Now, um, we also can go ahead, when we contact the lateral aspect of the occiput, we can fire it like this, or we can take the device classically and fire it right up here at what's called the pole and fire it forward. Now, also we talk about in uh, myofascial release technique, we talk about contacting the um, TMJ in the horse, and of course that's at this point right here, and we can go ahead and put a pulse into that area. We'll talk about that as we get a little further into this technology. Now, the other thing that we would mention is as we go through this horse, 
the, the length or the height of the uh, dorsal spinous processes of the dorsal vertebra, the thoracic vertebra, is, such, is so high that for us to use, this particular device sometimes does not work well. And so if we're going to contact them both at the same time, and by the way, I like to contact them both at the same time with this device. It just makes it so much easier. We'll talk more about the Vetrostim device as we go along. But we can go down with this basic bifurcated tool, this tool on the animal, and make that motions down through here from T2 down to about L2. And we go ahead and do those and clear out those areas with the pulse that we can make with this device. As you load the device, you can make a significant amount of motion like that. And so this is the, the reason that we use that device, or we can relegate to using just the basic tool. Now here we're just off on the zygopophyseal joints, and as we go back down there. As we've taken care of the neck, first we take care of the lumbar, I'm sorry, the para, uh, the paralumbar areas, the paravertebral areas rather, and then we go ahead and we go to the neck. A little bit different from the way that we do it in the VOM technology. Keep in mind that every horse that we do a somatovisceral approach to, every horse that we do that somatovisceral approach to, is going to, in fact, have had a VOM pass uh, 1, 2, and 3. So this would theoretically be the fourth pass. We'd start in the thoracics, then go up into the head and adjust the head. Now we're adjusting the parasympathetic nervous system up, up in here, and the sympathetic nervous system here. So sympathetic, parasympathetic, and then we jump back here to the parasympathetic system and contact uh, as 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Okay, and so that's the means by which we go ahead and somatoviscerally adjust the, uh, the, the equine. There are some other techniques that we'll use in modules five and six where we actually adjust the extremities for somatovisceral disease, and this is designed to open up and cause significant vasodilatation in areas that have been vasoconstricted due to subluxation of a somatovisceral nature, such as an animal with severe colic or uh, in enterocolitis producing a compromised blood flow to the hooves and then inducing a possibility, in this case, of laminitis and or founder. Now, and as we work with the, king, at the uh, equine, we want to make sure that they're able to understand what it is that we're up to with this device. They have no problems with this, and very, very seldom does it cause a pain. One of the nice things about the Vetrostim device is as soon as we place it on the horse and start to move it, they will calm down quite quickly. They like the, the uh, feel of it, they like the buzz of it, it seems to work out real well for them. So it's another re reason that we like to use it. Also, the Vetrostim device is used for horses to adjust a horse uh, that will not put up with being adjusted in general. So if they don't like the click of the activator device, they will allow us to use the Vetrostim device. We've uh, adjusted a number of stallions, uncut stallions who, in fact, were uh, not allowing us to get anywhere close to them with the uh, activator device because of its sound, sounding more like a tack, if you will and allowing us to use the uh, Vetrostim device. And in every case, we've been able to take care of it up to this point. Stim device, and what we're going to do is we're going to go down the animal on either side, and we're going to go through the thoracics. We're then going to go up to the uh, atlanto-occipital area to do the parasympathetic system. We're going to leave the neck alone relatively, and we're going to come back down, and we're going to do the sacral area. The animal can be lying, standing or lying flat, or the animal can be anesthetized to do this technique. We only have to go through one time, and the pulses are made at a classic fashion, the same pulse that we would make if we were just going ahead and adjusting them. Very commonly, I will use the maximum adjustment force, which, of course, is for this device, one ring exposed, one ring exposed. So classically, that's the way that we'll go about doing the dog. And um, what we're looking for is probably absolutely no response. However, very commonly off the paraspinal areas, very commonly you will see a reactive reading pattern. We're not looking for reading patterns in trying to deal with somatovisceral disease. All we're trying to do is put in the pulse on each and every location. The disadvantage of somatovisceral disease versus musculoskeletal disease reduction is that we don't have this reflexive arc to go by. So that's why we put a pulse in every location. Here, in fact, if we put a pulse in a location, if it, in fact, is a location that's compromised by subluxation, then we'll reduce the subluxation. Keeping in mind now, the subluxation cell body of origin does not exist in the intermedial, I'm sorry, in the, in the aspect of the spinal cord at the dorsal horn, but rather that cell body of origin is going to e exist in the para, uh, I'm sorry, in the paraspinal ganglion or the paravertebral ganglion, the prevertebral ganglion, and also up in the head and neck. In the equine, when we adjust somatovisceral disease, 
We're interested in, in tr treating a number of cases that we haven't been able to treat before, such as all types of colics and another, other disease conditions that we'll get to a little bit later on in the module. But what I wanted to make sure that you were aware of is that we again start in the thoracic vertebral segment. And, and we go through the area on either side. Now we can do that uh, jumping back and forth with the device, or we can take the VetraStim device and go down there in this fashion. Or we can actually use the, the adjustable uh, equine device, and we can go down in this regard and, and, and contact them down. This, this spread actually works better for both sides in the thoracic area, and is one of the reasons that we'll use this particular tool. Now, the thing that's interesting is we also will take the device, remove the stylus, and go up here, or we'll in fact use just the device by itself up here. And another good way that we'll uh, deal with that when we do the parasympathetics is we'll come up and we'll fire the pole down forward. And a little bit later we'll talk to you about contacting and, and adjusting the uh, TMJ here, here, up here at the neck, and down the length of the ramus of the mandible. Keep in mind that the mandible is the hardest bone in the animal's body, in the horse's body. Now, we do the parasympathetic system here, and we run down here and do the parasympathetic system down here. We can also take this tool, put it on either side of the PSIS, and come down and do the parasympathetics with this device too, which makes it quite easy. Then the last place that we'll treat in the equine actually is we'll come in and we'll go down the lateral processes, if you will, of the, th uh, the cervical vertebra. This is something that we do not do in the small dog because we really don't find it clinically uh, uh, something that we need to do. But in the horse, since they commonly have a lot of mid-cervical problems due to being wrenched around by their tack and uh, by uh, the way that they're reined, we'll very commonly will go in with a small bifurcation tip or just the device itself and contact the area in between, in between the lateral spinous processes. Now keep in mind that the lateral processes overlap and the area in between is harder to find than the lateral processes. But nonetheless, we'll go down and we'll do that and what we're trying to contact here, and we're going to do this on both sides, we're trying to contact, if you will, the vagosympathetic nerve trunk on either side. Keep in mind that on the left side, the vagosympathetic nerve trunk is separated away from the vagus, but nonetheless, it's in the same spot. So as we come down, click, 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 that's what we're trying to do, and we're trying to be in between these vertebral segments. The first one we're going to get is the one right in here, which is easy to get, but between two and three, Three and four, four and five, five and six, etc., all the way down the neck is how we're trying to go ahead and adjust the neck out. The neck can hold in a lot of problems that are going to descend down the uh, vagus nerve and compromise the gastrointestinal organs and also the viscera of the animal's body. So this is how we go about doing the equine. Now, the veterinary myofascial release technique is a technique that we've actually been doing for the last 10 years. And actually, you've probably been doing it to some degree as you've made adjustments with the VOM technology in these animals and not know about it. What we're trying to do is we're trying to release the myofascial, the muscle spasming aspect of the subluxation in the animal, to put the animal months to weeks ahead of schedule as far as its adjustment schedule is concerned. It becomes one of the most powerful tools that we have in the VOM technology to reduce the amount of adjustments and to accelerate the healing curve for this animal. Used with somatovisceral disease, we can cut the time of adjustment and, and uh, benefit from about three to four months down to about a month and a half to two months. And so that becomes particularly valuable and also it's a welcomed adjunct to the technology by the client because the client gets a kick out of it, the animal gets a kick out of it, you send the animal out of the hospital or back into the paddock, for instance, or back into the stall feeling better immediately instead of waiting for four or five days for the muscle spasms to go away or maybe even 48 hours for the muscle spasms to go away they go away within the body of that adjustment cycle and of course what we're trying to do is we're trying to provide um, a continual pulse in the muscle belly and reset the Golgi tendon apparatus and also reset that which has become if you will solidified the muscle itself has gone from a gel to a sol state because of its uh, fixation because of the skeletal muscle fixation and spasm. If we can remove that spasm, then what we're going to be able to do is rehabilitate that muscle immediately instead of we're going to wait for that to occur. Now the important thing to understand is that their myofascial release technique, particularly for the equine, has been out there before and it is a, it is a manual massage technique. 
which requires a contact to be held aggressively for anywhere from 90 to 120 seconds per area and then to do that several times in that area. To do myofascial release technique manually would require at least three hours to base per, per case and of course that would be prohibitively expensive. Now, the thing that we and also would take a huge amount of effort by the practitioner. The reason that we use an instrument in this case is, is for the reason that we use an instrument in all of the VOM technology is because it's easier, it's more effective, it's faster, and it's also a lot less strainful, uh, st uh, straining on the animal and also on the practitioner. So that's this is why we do it. We can do a lot more. We can do it all day long without compromising our own health. And um, the animals have a lot more patience for us to use this. As a matter of fact, they like it. Now, <clears throat> I will mention that as we use this pulse, instead of holding our hand on an area and stretching a muscle for 90 seconds, we're able to use a device and contact the device and quick motions, here again, about 7 to 10 milliseconds, we're able to make these pulses, and the pulse will immediately reset the Golgi tendon apparatus and the, and the muscle spindle fiber on the central aspect of that muscle and release the muscle spasm, which is something that we cannot do manually. There's no way that we can manually pulse that fast. So what we have to do when we manually use the technique is we have to actually wear the muscle down and it will rehabilitate uh, the problem within a matter of minutes. So we do it again, and we do it again, and we do it again until finally the muscle says to hell with it and just gives up. However, we don't have that amount of time, especially if we're trying to do at least a dozen or maybe three dozen places on the equine, and we also don't have that amount of strength. We can't do it all day long. However, uh, musculotherapy specialists and people who do this for a living musculotherapists basically have the strength and the ability to do this type of thing. It just takes too long. So we're able to use this as an adjunct to VOM care and an adjunct to somatovisceral care to make sure that the animal holds its adjustment for a longer period of time, needs less adjustments, and gets an immediate response to the treatment right off the bat. So we're able to send the animal home and the animal is feeling better, the clients feel it's better because their animal feels better, and everybody wins all the way around. The pulse itself, pulsing fast, in this case we can set this device from one pulse to multiple pulses and it's going to do then this. And an interesting thing about the device, the VetraStim device was designed specifically, or actually it was designed from a human device, was adapted to be able to be used on a parakeet and a percheron for instance. So we can use <clears throat> a complete range of motion from an animal that's less than a couple of ounces to an animal that weighs 2,000 pounds. We can also adjust bowls with it, but what it allows us to do is to put the motion on from a flutter, and as you increase the amount of pressure by pushing on the tissue, <coughs> you're going to get more and more motion. Watch this. And we can do this all day long in this particular case. This device actually will heat up in the handle because it uses a huge amount of energy. Now, people have said, gee, Dr. Bill, why don't you develop a device that has a battery pack so we don't have to hook it into the power cord? Well, first of all, if you're going to be adjusting an animal, you're going to have to have some light. Light means electricity, so you can plug it in. So instead of adapting a what looked like was going to be an 80-pound battery pack that's going to cost an extra $2,000, we figured that somebody could afford about $5 for an extension cord. So that's why we use the extension cord. Not only that, it uses a huge amount of energy, as it will, in fact, heat up. So if we're going to do this for 10 or 15 seconds per point all, all the way up and down a horse, this is going to generate more energy, and by the time that you'd be done with one case um, uh, using a battery pack, then you'd have to recharge the battery, which means you'd have to have two battery packs, which would cost $4,000, so you can understand why we didn't go for that particular technique. However, this device is like indestructible. A horse has stepped on this at least a dozen times, kicked it across the paddocks, etc., and this, in fact, um, device has worked out really well. We like the people who make them. They're very friendly. I apologize for the cost of the device. It's a medical device. It's always going to be expensive, whether it actually needs to be costing that much a lot. But keep in mind that each and every one of the collars are hand-machined. They're not injected. They're hand-machined. These are all lathe. And so because of that, they are, are, have a tendency to be uh, relatively uh, more expensive than if they were injected like a uh, toy that you'd buy at Toys R Us. Nonetheless, what we're going to do is we're going to place this device on the tissue and we're going to fire it in this nature until we get the phenomenon of myofascial release. Myofascial release suggests that the myofascia is tense to begin with and that it's going to in fact release after we do this. And if you are able to take in a spasming muscle, for instance, the spasming muscles of a dog, for instance, that has a blown disc, 
and you were to take a device, and what I'd like to use is, for instance, this device, and put it on either side of the pair of spinal tissues, and put it on there like this, and what will happen is immediately as you start to pulse it, so you'll pulse it for a few seconds, getting a little bit more motion in there, the animal will become used to that, that motion and start to relax, but the muscle of the longissimus will start to, to freeze up. It'll start to tense up, and then it'll release. It'll tense up, and then it'll release. And so what happens actually is you'll come in this area particularly, and you'll see it tense up, and then continue it, and then it releases. And that's myofascial release. What you've done is you've basically irritated the system to the point where you finally cleared it out, and you cleared out that muscle. That muscle now is released, and so you can go ahead and leave it alone. You only have to do it once as you pass through. So that's the way that we go about it. Up in the head and the neck, we can do the very same thing. We can take the stylus off and do it with this technique, and we can do it very, very light, very, very light. For all intents and purposes, I take the stylus and I drive it back. You can drive it all the way in like this, or but what I, I have a tendency to use it where the the uh, the, the central piece here is uh, uh, flush with the adjusting knob, and so that's the way that we go about using it. So we can go ahead and use it like this, and um, it'll cause the animal to spasm up and then release. We can also take the device. And we can come down the lateral side of the dog and the horse and contact it in that regard. The animal will spasm up and release. If you hold this device for at least 30 to 60 seconds and you don't get a spasming, then what you may already have is that your, your VOM adjustment may have already released that area, so you don't have to worry about it. However, like in somatovisceral disease, we go through the whole bo animal's body with this. It takes another five minutes to do this technology. However, the, the uh, animal benefits significantly, and so uh, is, in fact, the uh, client pleased with, with this approach. So we place the device in the areas that we're concerned about, and we let them release. Now, we're going to show you in the canine what that looks like on the skeleton to some degree. First of all, we're going to take the device, and we're going to go down, very much like in somatovisceral disease, we're going to go down the animal's body. We can either use the wide fork or the small fork, depending upon how big. In the feline, we're always going to use the small fork because that's the right size. We'll use the large fork in the canine, and we'll go on down in this regard, contacting these areas from T1 all the way down to L2, 3, or 4, all the way down. So we put this device on and vibrate it. Move it down a little bit and vibrate it. We're not going to put it on virtually every single solitary position, but we're going to let them overlap to some degrees as we go down the back. We're going to spend at least 10 seconds on each spot and, and wait to see if we get a spasm. You should, within 10 to 20 seconds, see a spasm if you're going to see one. And then as you see the spasm, you go ahead and continue to contact that spasm. And causing more pressure like that, the animal will relax, and then the actual uh, system will give way. Another thing that's interesting is you'll very commonly get this device to make a noise, spasms, and it'll look like that, and then all of a sudden when it releases, when it releases, it'll start to sound like that. It'll actually change in sound, so you can actually determine what's happening as the muscle system actually releases itself. It'll actually make a different sound, which makes it easy to determine whether or not you've got a problem that's being taken care of. So we go all the way down the back to about this lower area. And then, of course, we're going to contact other parts of the animal's body. For instance, we're going to come up into the neck, and we're going to contact these areas and try to release these areas too and then come down the lateral aspect of the neck. We can also come down the dorsal aspect of the neck as we come down through here. And then we'll do the other side. And then, as just like we did in the, uh, in the somatovisceral disease, we do the back, we do the head and neck, and then we come back down here and we'll do the pelvis too. And in that, in that regard, we get the pelvis taken care of. And then the last area that we're going to use in the canine is very commonly we'll come in underneath and do the neck in the temporomandibular area. What we're trying to do is we're trying to contact this area here. And for most dogs, the white fork works just perfectly, and they don't mind having that in that area. But now, here's a problem. There is a problem. When you take this device, which is loaded like this, and you turn it upside down, putting extra weight on it, it's going to fire with a little bit more strength upside down. So when you take it and put it in underneath the dog's neck like this and fire it, it's going to have increased amount of strength. You have to be careful with that, particularly if you're doing that in a small dog, and also particularly if you're using an adjustable fork. In this case, the equine adjustable fork is adaptable to a number of dogs. You can see 
in the plates, us uh, so using this fork on a Great Dane, of course. Okay, if we take this equine adjusting fork and place it on our Great Dane, notice that we've got the weight of this device, and it already starts off with a rather significant amount of force. You want to be careful when you use the device upside down as you'll scare the dog until they get used to it. So you lose it really lightly and then increase the force just like that. And we go through after we've done some atovisceral reductions if we're going to do one we do the basic VOM pass we do some atovisceral if we're going to do them and then we go through and we do the myofascial release to, to basically finish off the animal and we only go through one uh, myofascial release uh, approach and then we're done there. So three pulses with VOM, we go through three passes with VOM, and then we go through somatovisceral if we're going to do somatovisceral, and then we go through the uh, myofascial release technique to try to take care of all the muscles that may be spasming at that particular time. We leave the extremities alone in the canine and the feline. Sometimes we'll, we'll adjust uh, or we'll direct ourselves to attention towards the equine, but ordinarily not. Now, um, if in fact we're going to apply this technology to the dog. The dog is very, and the cat, even if they're grouchy like the ones that we have in this tape, they'll have a tendency to relax. The dog that we have in the tape is, is once we started to put motion in, his nervousness went away. The cat that we're going to show you actually is quite pissed off, just to, just to be real frank about it. He doesn't want to have anything to do with anybody, if you will. But once we start to put motion in with the device, he has a tendency to calm down. First they go like, what the heck is that? And then they go like, well that's not so bad. And then they go, no, that's pretty good. I kind of like that. And so that's what happens. Now, the horse, even the nasty horse, is more prone. When you start to put the motion into the horse, they have a tendency to try to figure out what it is, and then they relax quite quickly. Horses are endorphin monkeys, if you will. As soon as you start to release subluxations, they'll release endorphins. Their head drops down, and they usually do quite well. So this is what it looks like, uh, hopefully. Uh, in the canine. Um, keep in mind that this particular young dog doesn't really have any pathology that we're aware of. Um, you'll notice that this dog has had a surgery for a um, uh, 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 osteochondritis desiccans of its shoulder, um, but there doesn't appear to be any uh, subsequent effects that are, are being uh, held on, so this animal has been taken care of in that regard. Nonetheless, um, this dog doesn't have any pathology, so we're not going to see a whole lot of uh, pathological reflexes um, that are occurring and the muscle spasm is released. But nonetheless, this is what, what it looks like on a live animal. We use the larger of the two collars, or larger of the three collars, the one in the middle, for instance. And so this particular collar we're going to put in the paraspinal tissues, and we're going to start it right at about T. Uh, two or T1. So we'll, we'll start here and we'll start putting pressure into that tissue. And then as we continue to go, you'll notice that the dog may tense up and then release. And we're going to hit not every point, but we're going to hit the points, all the points down to the side. Keep it in mind that I'm on the longissimus muscles. It's okay. It's okay. When you take the device, you're able to put it on lightly like this and then put more pressure onto it until you get some tension. Now what you should see as you continue to put pressure on, the muscles will tense up and then they release. And of course, Wilhelmina doesn't have a problem, so we're not, we're not actually releasing any problems that she might have. And so as we come down her back, particularly in this area, you'll see it tense up like this, and then finally release as we continue motion. What you're doing is you're actually settling out that whole subluxation pattern cooling out the, um, actually calming down the muscle and allowing it to relax itself. And then we're going to come to the wings of the ilium, I'm sorry, the wings of the pelvis. We need to change the device to some degree to get it to work here. And so as we contact the wings of the pelvis, or the, we're right on top of them now and we're going to put light pressure on them. Notice this feels a little funny for her. We're not on the muscle, but rather the way that the muscles are attached in this regard. And so we're coming back like that. And you see she'll come right down as we do that. Now, we can also do the same thing, but we're not going to on her, on the ischial areas. And that's not a problem for her necessarily, like this. And so that completes that. Now we're going to go back up to the head. As we go up to the head, we're going to take this device and we're going to, we're going to add on back the small device. And we're going to come up the vagosympathetic nerve trunk and the muscles of the side of the face, like this. 
And of course, we'll do this in the equine too, and it'll release these muscles. Of course, her problem is not going on there. Now we can go up on this regard, and we can also come up here from the top. And I'll have to use the larger of the wide forks in a big dog and a small dog, you'd use the small forks. And the same thing with the cat. Now, the last thing that we'll do, and this is particularly important for this dog to release some of the um, somatovisceral disease, and it's also particularly for muscles of the head and neck continually uh, out, is we'll come in behind her head just like this, and we'll put that pulse in there. Notice that Wilhelmina doesn't have a problem with this motion. She doesn't like the clicker device, but this doesn't bother her. Okay. And then we'll come in underneath her, and a lot of dogs have difficulties with this one until after we place it. And you just find that normal spot, and there's only one place to put it. And be careful because you have the weight of the device on it, too, so you want to come in real light at first because it's kind of scary for her. And then that's the, that's the end of uh, the um, myofascial release for this dog. Not very difficult. It would be nice to show some spasming, but we're not seeing that. Okay? You come all the way out for the cat. We set it flush. We use the smaller of the two bifurcated tips. We're going to start in myofascial release for the spasming cat, and it's particularly effective in the lower back with cats with disease conditions that we'll talk about in Module 4. And we'll come down the back of the kitty cat looking for the same type of tension. There's one, and here's, okay, and we come down the back trying to release mild the spasm. We'll sometimes leave it anywhere from 20 to 60 seconds before we actually come off of it. But here, um, our little kitty cat is not giving as much of anything at all, which is okay too. And so that completes that. We'll sometimes use this device, holding it on there to make a contact to the pelvis. It's okay, honey. Notice the cat doesn't like to be touched back here. And that's why. We're going to release this kitty cat smell. There it is. And it released right there. You can even hear the device making a different sound. Um, cats that do not care to be touched back here, and Shaky is one of them, are cats that have a numb spot or a pain or discomfort back in this area. I'm also going to take, while I have her here, him here, is I'm going to take this device and put it on the wings of the pelvis, like this, because this is where Shaky's not having a lot of fun. It doesn't like to be touched back here because it doesn't feel good. It's okay, Shaky. It's okay, Shaky. But, there we go. Okay. And so that clears itself out. so horrible, was it? And then we're going to go back, back up to the neck and we're going to do the areas in the side of the neck and we can use the small or the large bifurcation piece to do so. It's okay, it's okay, it's all right, honey. And I'm moving down the neck and I'm also going to go on the side and I'll do it on the other side too a lot longer than what I'm showing you here, but these are the positions. And then we'll take this device, just like we did in a larger dog, go behind the head, forward. It's best that you always put it on very lightly before you start to apply pressure. And then we'll come up underneath our kitty cat's head like this, sometimes uncomfortable for our cat. This is the one you have to be careful with because... There we go. All right, and then leave her alone, and or him alone. Sorry, Shake. And so this is, in fact, the way that we'll go about clearing myofascial release in this kitty cat, too. Now, this cat doesn't have any problems, except for the pain that's in the lower back here. Real common for cats that don't like to be touched back here. You notice that Shakey likes to be touched just about any time, though, so that's okay with this kitty cat. Okay? Of course, because it takes all of the strength away. If we had to adjust, uh, if we had to myofascially release the horse, the, uh, we would be uh, exhausted in, inside of one adjustment, and of course it would take us all day. Plus also the horse isn't particularly crazy about manual uh, myofascial release, plus also every time that we have to hold a position, we have to do it multiple times, and we have to hold it anywhere from 90 to 120 seconds as opposed to about 10 seconds with this device. So this is why we use devices to cut down time and to make it more effective and also to keep us from, from being coming exhausted. In the equine, we can, use, um, we can use the basic wide fork tool up in the thoracics, and we can go all the way down in classic fashion, just like we've done before. I like to use the equine adjusting instrument, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 
and make the adjustment of the device further out and closer to try to endeavor to try to get closer to these bladder meridians as we go down the back of the horse's, um, the, the dorsum of the horse's back, and the paravertebral uh, ganglion. And so what we'll do is we'll take this a rather untenable device, and this is a prototype. Uh, the, the, the ones that are going to come out are actually going to be much smaller. We hold on to it, and then we'll go down and we'll do the same thing. Notice it's going to pulse on either, on either side. Keep in mind that this piece has to be machined completely. It's quite an extensive piece of machinery that is going to be able to cause the pulse to be adequately transferred from the device to the head of the device without being absorbed by uh, flexibility. So it's completely non-flexible. It is non-flexible and doesn't move. Of course, that's the nature of what, it, of what we had to devise to do this. The reason that we devised it is so for a big horse, we can be all the way out here. For a cat or a dog, we can be all the way in here. We can adjust the width of this device very effectively for virtually any creature that we see down to a small cat, up to a really big horse. Some of the biggest horses that I saw were not necessarily the big Percherons, which would actually adjust in about this area, but rather some other standard breads that had some very wide areas in the lower back that we had to try to find the, the bladder meridian. And so we'll come down and do these guys like this, and then we'll come up into the neck of a horse and I like to use this device in the neck of a horse. We come up and underneath it like this, and we'll contact either aspects of the uh, uh, area right up here in this area at the occipital area. And so also up underneath in the tracheal area, we'll contact this area too. Also, I'll hold my wife down and do her with this technique too, which she's not usually too crazy about. I usually have to tie her muzzle shut, otherwise she'll bite me. <coughs> Nonetheless, and what we'll also do is we'll take this device off and very commonly we'll then use the what I call the feline uh, or the small bifurcated tip and then we'll come down the lateral aspects of the neck and the, in the equine keeping in mind that somatovisceral is done in the equine in the neck and, so, and the neck adjustment is done in small animal in myofascial release and also of course the equine myofascial release is done in the neck. Real important area to go ahead and clear out these areas. These will spasm quite a little bit. One of the areas that spasm, and this is something that you can show the client in the horse, is that area over the withers where we have a hyper fasciculation of the withers area. And so what you'll do is you'll place this device right on there. The withers will start flopping around as they always do and they don't seem to want to stop. And then finally we'll just exhaust those muscles, calm them down, and basically the animal won't have that muscle fasciculation. You may have to do it one or two or three times in that particular area because that's a real hot area in the equine. But the good news, though, is down in their lower back when we take this device, and very commonly we'll either use this or we'll use this device in the lower back, and we'll apply it in those areas, and we'll contact those areas. The animal's butt will rump down, rump back, rump down, rump back, and finally calm down. And the horse usually changes its attitude and changes its, um, its balance and changes its, its weight up from one leg to the other leg in the lower back. Then we can also use, and I'll use this tool, and also specifically use this tool at the PSIS down through here, now using the, the equal, I'm sorry, the feline tool at the PSIS, and we'll then come down the areas of the uh, sacral vertebral and, and, and adjust those areas. Here again, they're going to cause the butt to rump and also the animal to change its muscle, musculature to its rear leg, so it's going to change its balance back and forth. And there'll be a number of other changes that you'll see, including endorphin release, the head comes down, the mouth drops open, and we're involved with um, in, in endorphin release in the, in the feline. I'm sorry, in the equine. Another way to use the device, too, in the equine, particularly in the head, is to come up and contact the area where the, um, where the nerves come out of the skull, which is right up in this area here, and contact those areas. And then also we'll contact, at this point, we'll contact the uh, temporomandibular joint on one side. We'll go on the other side with it, and then we'll come up underneath it, and down the length of the ramus of the mandible, like this. And so that is how we adjust the TMJ. TMJ adjusting is not osseous adjusting much as much as it's somatovisceral adjusting because we're trying to adjust the muscle set of the masseters and of the muscles that, and the temporalis muscles that hold the set of the jaw so they can come back. Keep in mind that when you adjust the TMJ of the equine, you are never to do so and come back and do it again in the following week unless the animal's teeth have been taken care of. If, in fact, they're hooked over and the animal's teeth need to be floated. For you to adjust a, 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 an animal's uh, TMJ when they have spurs on their teeth without getting them floated, the next time you're just wasting the client's time because they do, in fact, need to be floated because that's probably what's causing the problem in the first place. This is uh, uh, 
I'm sorry, uh, myofascial, veterinary myofascial release technique for the equine. It's probably the easiest one to do. It usually takes less than five minutes to do a whole horse. By the time you get done, your horse is just a big pile of goo, and you basically pour him back into his stall, and he should be fine. As far as moving him afterwards, we would recommend that he not be necessarily stalled the rest of the day, but allowed to wander around in, in his, uh, in his uh, pen, wherever he's kept, and uh, not necessarily ever placed on a hot walker, or if at all possible, to keep him from being thrown back in a trailer and being trailered for 10 or 8, eight hours. That would be, of course, not the best thing in the whole wide world. However, if an animal has to be put in a trailer, which is common, and trailered for a couple of hours before he can be put back into his barn, after you've made it a VOM adjustment, this is an excellent means to, to basically hold on to the benefit that you've created with the VOM technology by going ahead and giving him this type of adjustment. This is another reason that the uh, veterinary myofascial release technique is, being, is used so proliferatively in equine practitioners because they basically present it as this. I'm going to get their animal taken care of with the, that which causes the, sub, or the uh, myofascial problem and then by reducing the subluxation and then we're going to ensure that will stay on board by uh, taking away the spasm of the muscle that's uh, the secondary problem. So we take care of the primary problem and then the secondary problem and then the animal holds its adjustment on its way home if they have to be trailered. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I appreciate very much your um, interest in the VOM technology per se. Keep in mind that VOM Module 4 um, has a huge amount of data in involved with that uh, particular module. And I encourage you to read it from cover to cover because it has a huge amount of information that we cannot get to in a tape or in the slide presentation for VOM Module 4. In the upcoming VOM Module 5, we're going to use some advanced techniques and a mild, advanced myofascial release techniques and somatovisceral disease conditions. And also in Module 6, we're going to do an equine specialty course where all we will do is adjust horses uh, for the whole weekend with a number of different technologies, trying to put together a number of complex disease situations and the healing solutions for those. Module 7 upcoming and we probably won't be available until January of 2001 is in fact a teaching module where I will endeavor to teach people to teach the VOM module 1, 2, and 3 throughout the United States. Um, thanks again for your uh, uh, kind patience in sitting through this uh, uh, tape and um, I wish you well and good luck. If you have any questions you can call me and usually reach me in my office in Seattle area code 206-523-9917 unless it's the weekend when you'll probably find me in another city delivering modules 1, 2, 3, and 4. And have a great day.